This is TalkLoudRadio.com. What is going on, guys? Welcome to episode 29 of the Armchair Fantasy Show. I'm your host, of course, Jeff Lambert. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Lambert 77. You can also follow the show at Talk Loud Podcast on Twitter. Uh, of course, you can find us, the audio version, on all your major podcast services, iTunes, Stitcher, etc. We are live every Tuesday night at around 930. And of course, we are streaming on the Going for Two app as well. Uh, we got a great show tonight. Uh, I'm bringing on a first-time guest. Uh, he's the owner and operator of Fantasy Football Fraternity on Facebook. Uh, it's a very, very large fantasy football uh, Facebook page. You should check it out. Uh, but without further ado, let's intro uh, Mr. Ed Fingerhut of the Fantasy Football Fraternity. Man, how you doing tonight? Good, sir. How you doing tonight? I'm good, man. I'm good. I got my beer here, and I'm ready to roll, man. Ready to talk some fantasy football, man. Is there anything better? Definitely, man. Definitely. I, I love it, man. I could talk it all year long, which I pretty much do. So it's good stuff, man. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and kind of uh, go over some of the news and notes of the NFL right now. Uh, a couple things here and there. Of course, this time of year, there's not a whole lot of news. Uh, so I'm kind of reaching on some of this stuff, but I just want to get your opinion on a few of these things. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is uh, a Dolphins receiver. He uh, he was a chief last year, got signed to the Dolphins. Uh, Albert Wilson, he's sort of uh, impressing, I guess, in OTAs. He's taking over sort of the Jarvis Landry role in the Dolphins' offense. Uh, how do you feel about Albert Wilson, and are you buying this that he's he's having a good camp? Uh, yeah, I I am buying it. I mean, you got to take what the Dolphins say with a grain of salt. I don't know if you remember last year, but Jay Ajahe was going to rush for two thousand yards. <laughs> Parker and Landry were going to rush for are going to receive fifteen hundred yards each. Santa Hill was the second coming. I mean, you got to take it with a grain of salt, but Albert Wilson should have a lot of targets there with Landry gone. I definitely agree. I think Landry opens up a lot of targets. You know, he was their target monster. Devontae Parker was more their big play receiver. Um, so I think he steps into that role. Is he as good as Landry? Probably not. But I think in fancy football, sometimes volume could make you fancy relevant. And I think that uh, I think he can step into that role and be be a relevant receiver there in, in Miami. And we know that Tannehill likes to uh, keep it underneath. He's always been a short pass kind of guy. He's never been a deep thrower, so uh, I think that helps Albert Wilson as well. Uh, the next thing I got on here is uh, Jets fourth round rookie tight end uh, Chris Herndon uh, arrested for DUI. Of course, he's supposed to be replacing um, Austin Safarian Jenkins in that Jets offense. Uh, rested for DUI. Apparently he totaled uh, a land cruiser and smashed up some 70 or 76 year old man. Uh, what do you, what do you feel about this? I mean, do you think he'll get a suspension from the league? Does this guy drop down in, in drafts? Now, if you were drafting this guy in any of your leagues, what do you think about this? Uh, I don't know. I think they need, uh, I didn't think they need to round with some bodyguards for these jets, uh, <laughs> receivers and tight ends with Anderson there too. Um, honestly, I, he wasn't really on my radar. I am a Jets man myself, and he wasn't on my radar too much. J- Safarian Jenkins was kind of an, anom- an anomaly. If you look back for the Jets the past even 10 years, they really haven't had a lot of big play tight ends. They kind of do a mismatch of receivers, and besides the first year of Fitzpatrick, they just do whatever on offense, basically. They try to pound the ball a little bit but they really don't throw the tight end. He wasn't on my radar. He might be suspended a game or two. I did see the headline. It didn't look too good in his favor, though. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah, I actually had a, a recent, uh, uh, my dynasty league, my main dynasty league, and we have a guy in our league. I had him on my show, I think, a few weeks ago. Uh, we call him the Jinx because he does. He kind of jinxes everybody. I mean, he owned uh, 
Carson Wentz and Deshaun Watson last season. Of course, we saw how that went. Both had season ending injuries. Uh, so we have this draft on on Sunday and we find out shortly after the draft that this guy has been arrested for a DUI. And of course, he drafted him in that dynasty uh, draft as well. So uh, the jinx holds true once again. Uh, so uh, definitely, I think he drops in drafts. I think if you're doing dynasty, uh, he was a deep round flyer anyway. Um, so I don't think too many people are going to be upset about it, but just kind of interesting to note, you know, that he's supposed to take over Austin Safari Jenkins role and he gets suspended uh, with the, or he gets a possible suspension with a DUI. All right. The next thing I got on here is uh sort of, uh, sort of not football related. Uh, it is in the sense that a player was hurt uh, actually playing softball. Uh, so Clay Matthews linebacker from the green Bay Packers, you know, obviously takes a softball to the face, breaks his nose, uh, you know, obviously not fantasy related unless you play in IDP leagues, uh, but it could affect the uh, Packers defense a little bit. Uh, first of all, did you see the play? Did you see what actually happened? And, and how do you feel about it? Yes, I have watched that video at least 20 to 30 times. It's just <laughs> unbelievable. Just right to the face. It's it. I I don't know what to say. It's just he took it like a champ right to the face. <laughs> yep, definitely, definitely. I think uh, I think I heard that he will be cleared for for uh, the start of the preseason and all that. So nothing to worry about there. But just kind of interesting to note, you can get hurt playing any kind of sport, even softball. <laughs> oh, I mean, you can get hurt anytime. Remember uh, Robert Edwards, probably fifteen twenty years ago now in uh, at the Pro Bowl, tearing his ACL playing volleyball. That's right. That's right. And I think there was a player that actually hurt himself falling down the stairs one year. I can't remember who it was, but I remember someone just fell in. His, that's what they claim. You know, who knows? He's probably playing some sport he wasn't supposed to or something that was in his contract. But the, the claim was he fell down the stairs and, and tore an ACL after the year. So you can get hurt doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, all right. Next next one I got on here is uh, Chicago Bears new wide receiver Taylor Gabriel. Um uh, Matt Nagy, the new head coach, is saying that he expects Gabriel to be more than just a gadget player, which has kind of been his entire career. Uh, are we buying this? Are we? Do we think he's going to be anything more than just a gadget, sort of maybe a go-deep guy or like a gadget kind of play guy? In super deep leagues, I've been picking him up in the later rounds. The problem is, this Browns, I mean, they just, it's one of those situations where you just have a lot of people coming into a new offense on a team that's going to be based around the running game and a young defense with Allen Robinson is probably going to command 125 targets or 150 targets himself. Plus whatever else they got there. They got the new rookie, Anthony Miller, Gabriel. I mean, they brought in a ton of receivers too. Fowler from Denver. They brought in so many players that I think, I mean, I think he's good for some big play, maybe a fill in type deal some standard leagues with some touchdowns, but I'm only looking at him in deeper leagues for my, as far as redrafts are concerned. Yeah, definitely. I agree hundred percent. I think they were trying to put a comp in here with, with Nagy and Tyreek Hill and how they're similar sort of players, but I disagree. I think Gabriel is a gadget player. He's going to be nothing more than that. I think deep leagues, he's definitely worth a flyer, um, but you're right. I mean, you got Allen Robinson there. You got Anthony Miller, the rookie, uh, they still have Kevin White, believe it or not. He's still with the team. Uh, who knows what he actually does this year. Uh, they signed Trey Burton from the Eagles tight end. They still got Tarek Cohen. They got you know Jordan Howard. So Gabriel is sort of like maybe the seventh or eighth option in that offense. So I don't see him doing too much in fantasy unless you're in a really deep league, which there are some deep leagues out there. I know I'm in a, a 36-man, 16-team league. It's kind of ridiculous. We're at the point now in our draft where we're drafting guys that aren't even playing. Like someone just uh, drafted Eric Reed, uh, safety for the 49ers. <laughs> basically, he's a free agent right now. Doesn't even have a team, uh, but he's on a fancy team because we, we basically ran out of players to draft. Um, all right. So next one I got on here is uh, we'll go back to the Dolphins again with Devontae Parker. Uh, of course, his, uh, his his sort of knock on his career so far has been that he has been putting in the time uh, to get better. He's just the same player he was when he came into the league. Uh, apparently now they're saying that he is putting more time into the, you know, into his craft, uh, spending more time at the facility to sort of get better. Um, are you drafting Parker this year? And are you expecting more things from him this season? Uh, it's, it's more of that Miami smoke screen. Everybody's going to be a hall of famer next year <laughs> type deal for me. Parker's I I've had high hopes for Parker before I might take a late round flyer on him, but where he's going to be drafted 
he's going to be drafted as probably your fourth or fifth wide receiver. No, thank you. In my, in my book, I think they brought in Amendola and they brought in Wilson for a reason. And those guys are going to get the targets also with the rookie. Uh, I, I can't pronounce Gusecki. Oh yeah. Gusecki, um, the, the tight end. And Drake is a pass catching back. Plus they have Gore. They're going to try to pound the ball. I just don't see Parker being an option. I see them running kind of similar offense to maybe like the Patriots, a lot of underneath, maybe take a few shots downfield. They don't have Gronk of course, but not, I, I, I'm not buying it. He's not going to be on any of my teams unless he falls. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I think if we looked at uh, his history with Tannehill, uh, Tannehill kind of killed his value a little bit because Tannehill is that sort of short underneath throw. I think at one point, uh, the last year before he got injured, uh, he was averaging the, the least amount of depth per pass. Um, I think it was something like five yards from the line of scrimmage. It was ridiculously low. Uh, he doesn't throw the ball downfield very much, and that's Devontae Parker's game is basically the 50-50 balls going downfield. So with Tannehill at QB, I expect a lot of underneath Amendola and Albert Wilson and a little bit of dump-offs to Kenyon Drake and their new tight end. So you're right. Devontae Parker's probably fourth on that pecking order as far as receivers go, and uh, no thank you. All right, last one I got on here is a receiver that's still a free agent, uh, kind of crazily so that they signed uh, the Seahawks signed Brandon Marshall, and this guy is still out there on the free agent market. But Des Bryant, uh, the word is now that he probably won't sign until training camp. He wants the right situation. He wants to go to a winning team. Um, what do you think about Des Bryant? Do you think he's still got anything left? And if you had to guess, where does he end up? Oh, I mean, Des Bryant in the right situation, of course, is going to be a top 15 wide receiver. It depends where he goes. At this point, he's waiting so long. I mean, there might be an injury here or there. There have to be, I think, a significant injury, like kind of a, kind of like the Steve Smith situation when he went to Baltimore a few years back, where he's kind of flirting with retirement. But, you know, he went there, learned the playbook quickly, and went right in. He also needs to learn how to hold out of the ball. Uh, I know that's a shot at the Cowboys fans, but <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think uh, Des Bryant. I think he sort of shot himself in the foot because he wanted a big contract, and of course, he wasn't going to get that in Dallas. And then he goes to free agent, and he thinks his worth he's worth more than he actually is. And I think that team sort of passed up on that. And now they're getting their players. That you know, we've had the draft now, we've had free agency. You know, they're in camps now. They're learning the playbook. No one's going to want to sign Des Bryant in the training camp, unless they have a need, unless somebody gets injured, unless they look at their receivers and go, you know what? We're not, you know, as strong as we want to be. Uh, I think he's going to get like a one year prove it deal and not as much as he wants. I think he's going to end up on a team eventually. Uh, but to sort of hand pick who you want to play for when you're a free agent, uh, that's going to be kind of risky there. I think uh, you just take a page out of uh, Brandon Marshall's book and just go with the first team to sign him. But uh, yeah, I think Des Bryant can be a top player in this league uh, in the right situation. If he can be a red zone threat, uh, I think he still has something left, but he needs to lower expectations as far as contract that he's going to get for him. I just got a, a, uh, a note here on, on Facebook Live uh, from Jerry. He says they'd love him in Buffalo, which Buffalo's got some needs there at receiver for sure. What do you think about him going to Buffalo? Well, it depends who's going to be throwing in the ball. Uh, a rookie QB with accuracy issues or a uh, lifetime bench player with a pageant wife, or <laughs> whoever, or 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 a interception machine that could throw five picks in one half. I mean, yeah, <laughs> those are your options in Buffalo. <laughs> Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> uh, actually, I do I do kind of like AJ McCarron as that sort of stopgap. Um, so I I think he could be decent there. I think it's kind of funny. I had to talk about this in the off season, and of course, when they drafted a quarterback, it kind of killed my thought, but. If you look at uh, Jimmy Garoppolo's numbers in his first like six, seven games as a starter and A.J. McCarron's uh, numbers as a starter, they're very, very similar. Uh, but Garoppolo gets all the pub because he played for the Patriots. And, of course, uh, uh, McCarron played for the Bengals. But uh, I think he can be a decent quarterback in this league with the right situation. Uh, I don't know if that place is going to be Buffalo, though. They kind of don't have a lot of pieces around him. Uh, I, I just don't see it happening there. But if they do end up getting Des Bryant, it could work out. Well, yeah, the both McCarron and Garoppolo both need to turn over their interception ratio. 
that's they, they have all the arm strength and talent in the world. It's the interceptions that kill both of them. Yep, agreed, agreed. As a 49ers fan, I can agree with that because I saw Grappolo a lot last season. Now, granted, I think he threw five picks last year. I think two of them, uh, one of them was a deflection and one of them was a Hail Mary pass that got picked off at the end of the half. So it was a little bit inflated uh, in that sense. But uh, I see him try to force things into the to small holes that just aren't there sometimes. So I can see the the interceptions happening for sure. All right, let's go ahead and introduce the topic of this podcast now that we've done the news and notes here. We're going to be uh, talking some second and third year wide receivers. Uh, pretty much everyone that we're going to talk about from here on out will be a second or third year wide receiver that is not a household name right now. Uh, maybe he becomes a household name. Uh, it's players that maybe struggled their first or second year that no one really knows about or, or have forgotten about. Uh, so we're going to kind of break those guys down and, and kind of get your thoughts on what you think of some of these guys. Uh, and we'll start off by playing a little breakout or fake out. Um, it's a game I like to play. Basically, I'm going to give you a name of a player, and you're going to label him a breakout uh, or a fake out, which means that everyone's going to think that he's a breakout, and then he doesn't. Uh, he sort of fakes everybody out, if you will. Uh, just kind of give me a reason why you think so. Uh, and we'll start off with uh, with one of my favorite receivers. I actually just recently traded him away, and I kind of hated that I did it. Uh, but Chris Godwin for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, there's a chance that he might get the third receiver slot there, maybe even take over Deshaun Jackson at number two. Uh, he's getting a lot of pub in uh, in in the OTAs and camps right now. What do you think of Chris Godwin? Is he a breakout or a fake out this year? You know, when you first think about him, you think fake out because of the what they have there, Deshaun Jackson, who you know takes off about five or six games of injury every single year anyway. And of course, Mike Evans is going to demand 150 targets as well. But the more I look at it, I really think that he could outplay D. Jax and really find his niche in this offense. Originally, I would think fake out, but I could see fake out with him improving his numbers. He only had 55 targets last year for 34 catches, which is okay, which is an okay rate at 50 yards per catch. It's just with everything going on there with the tight ends. Who knows why they drafted OJ Howard with right <laughs> there. And they still have two, the two tight ends. They drafted a uh, running back in the second round and they still have Evans there. I mean, I don't want to say a total breakout, but he could easily double his numbers up to 60 or 65 catches, which would be a breakout for him if you're doubling his numbers. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that's right where I have him, too, is sort of doubling up what he did last season. I think he does eventually take over for Deshaun Jackson, be it because of injury or because they just want to get young guys in there. And Jackson's going to get paid a lot of money, probably end up getting cut by next season. So they want to see what they have in Chris Godwin. Um, I drafted him uh, his rookie year on my Dynasty League, and I sort of held on to him up until this past season. And eventually I just had to trade him away because I had some better options there. But uh, I think he can be a good receiver in some deep leagues. Now, if you're playing a redraft league in a 10-12 team league, I, I probably wouldn't recommend drafting him unless you want to take a deep league flyer uh, or a deep round flyer. But yeah, I think uh, I think Chris Godwin, he's on the right path. Uh, he may be just one more year before his true breakout when he can actually be the number two receiver there in Tampa Bay. Uh, but someone to watch in Dynasty for sure. If he's out there as your free agent by chance, uh, may want to pick him up. All right, uh, next guy on our list here. Um, he had a really good rookie season uh, last year, dealt with some injuries, also had some receivers that were signed to, to sort of take his place. Uh, didn't do quite as well in year two. Uh, now going into year three, I'm hearing some good things out of camp about him, and this is a, a player for the New York Giants, uh, Sterling Shepard. What do you think of Shepard now that he basically has that slot pretty much lined up with Brandon Marshall now gone and, you know, of course, uh, Odell Beckham's coming back, but it looks like it's going to be Odell Beckham, Sterling Shepard as the receivers up there. Oh, I love Shepard as a breakout. The, his value alone is he's getting dropped around the 10th round, which if you think about it, you know, that's your third, fourth, fifth wide receiver in some leagues. I'll take that value any day. He showed last year that he could be a number one receiver when healthy with OBJ out of there. About eight TDs, his rookie campaign. I mean, <clears throat> there's not much to say about his value. His value, al- his value alone, has him as a breakout candidate. I could see him getting double-digit touchdowns this year in the red zone, and probably 75 to 80 catches on top of what OBJ gets. Yeah, I agree. I think I like him a lot as well. I think uh, 
you know, now that he's kind of got, if he can stay healthy, that's the, that's the caveat here is he has to stay healthy. He couldn't stay healthy last season. Uh, but I think as a, as a second fiddle to, uh, to uh, Odell Beckham there. And of course they did draft uh, Saquon Barkley. So they have the threat of the run now, which they didn't really have in the past. Um, so they'll be stacking the box a little bit more with Saquon Barkley in the, in the backfield. So Shepard can get some one-on-one matchups. I think he can definitely win some of those matchups. And uh, Eli Manning, you know, when he's not under pressure, can be a fairly accurate quarterback. So I think Shepard has a pretty good season this year. And where he's being drafted, pretty low in drafts, I think he's definitely some good value. All right, before we move on to the next one here, I just had a question on uh, Facebook Live I wanted to run by you real quick. Uh, Who do you think will lead the Cowboy wide receivers in touchdowns this season? Alan Hearns, uh, Beasley, or the new rookie Gallup? If you had to pick one of those three, who's leading them in touchdowns? Ooh, that's a that's a tough one. I mean, I love Gallup. Hearns needs to prove that he's uh, he can stay healthy. Honestly, I think I'm surprised that I think Beasley could easily lead them in touchdowns this year. He's done it before. He's he's done it with Des there. He he finds his niche. He's kind of like an Edelman, Wes Welker type player. Right, right. He's unassuming. And I like him this year. Yeah, I think that him and Dak had a good chemistry there as well. I think if I think if Dak can get that chemistry with Gallup, I think Gallup is a good candidate for it. I don't see Hearns leading them in the, in touchdowns. I just think Hearns is you know a good receiver, but he's just I don't know. I just I, I I feel like I like Gallup a little bit more there. I think Beasley is a good option, but if I had to pick one of those three, I think I'm gonna take Gallup to lead the lead to lead the Cowboys in uh, in touchdowns this season. All right, let's move on to my next receiver here for breakout or fake out. Uh, this guy uh, is going into his third year. has been a big disappointment in Cincinnati. Uh, we're talking about Tyler Boyd. Uh, breakout or fake out for Tyler Boyd this season? Ooh, I'm going to go fake out on that one. I, I don't like the Bengals this year. I think, I don't, I don't know why they brought Marvin Lewis back, to tell you the truth. I think he's a <laughs> lame duck coach. He's been, he's been a lame duck coach for a few years now. Um, I love what they've done in Cincinnati, but I mean, they're going in a different direction and AJ green demands all the deep targets. Who knows what's going to happen with the receiving core. Eifert, maybe he'll be healthy. It's always the injuries with them though. This, this team, if you put them on paper two, three years ago, this is the most talented team in the league on paper. It's just injuries, poor coaching. They looked absolutely horrendous last year in <laughs> for the, about the first five or six games. I believe they fired their offensive coordinator. I'm not buying into anything unless your name is AJ green or Mixon. I'm not buying into anything over in Cincinnati. All right. I guess that kind of answers my next question then. Cause the next, next one was the receiver they drafted last season uh, had literally the worst season that I can remember as a first round wide receiver, a first round player period. Uh, as a receiver, he had zero catches, one carry, and on that carry, he fumbled the ball, and that's John Ross. I, what, do we, what do you think? Fake out or break out this year? Oh, of course I'm going to go fake out on him. I mean, he's too busy trying to race people on social media <laughs> and everything else. I think a lot of the hype was his 40 time at the Combine. I mean, he's okay. I mean, like, like his, you got to see above with Boyd. He's not going to, he's going to be a speedster. It takes a lot of these speedsters a long time to really pick up traction too. Look at Marquise Goodwin in San Francisco. This is, was he 20, I believe he's 27 now or 26, 27. Somewhere in that range. He yep. didn't get going. He didn't get that, that traction right away. A lot of those speedsters need to learn how to run routes correctly and not overrun the football. And plus, I mean, Boyd's going to beat him out for a, a second spot and he's not going to overcome AJ green. And they throw the ball, they check down an incredible amount to Bernard and I'm sure Mixon. So I'm going to go fake out with John Ross for sure. Even in dynasty, I I'll take a flyer on that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I'm going to fake out as well. I think, uh, I think you have a better season than he did last year. I mean, it's hard to have a worse season than that. I mean, one carry for in one fumble, you basically had negative fancy points last year for an entire few years. So that's pretty bad. Uh, so it's hard for him to be worse, but I think he'll be okay, uh, but not what they hoped that he, that he was going to be when they drafted him to begin with. All right, now we're going to go up to Buffalo. We talked about them a little bit earlier uh, to a, a second-year receiver, Zay Jones. Uh, what do you think of Zay Jones, uh, breakout or fake out? 
Oh, man. I was one of the people that, that drank a little bit of a cool last year and took him took him high in a rookie draft. I was he really seemed like he was gonna be number one, but and I got seeing pictures of him at hotels and videos of him <laughs> at hotels going crazy. Um, Buffalo, they're gonna have a rookie Q a rookie QB or a journeyman QB. Benjamin's gonna be the, the red zone threat there. They're running they're running focused anyway. I'm going to go ahead and go fake out on him as much as I'd like to go. Everything trends in the wrong direction for him. If you look at all the numbers and all the paper and all the off the field stuff, he tried, he's really trended downward since, since the draft. Yep. I'm with you there as well. I'm also going fake out for Zay Jones. I just don't think they have enough weapons there uh, for him to really shine. Quarterback will be an issue, of course, uh, depending on who is the quarterback there. McCarron. Um, or the rookie quarterback. So, yeah, I, I agree. I think Zay Jones is going to be a fake out. Uh, next one we got here, again, had a good rookie season. Uh, last year was uh, injured a little bit with his hand and did not quite as good a season. Now he comes into his third year, but he's going to be playing with uh, with Josh Gordon and Jarvis Landry, and they drafted a rookie wide receiver in the draft. Uh, Corey Coleman, breakout or fake out this year? I'm going to have to go fake out on him. All the news and everything points to they were they've been trying to trade him. And I mean I remember watching the very last game of the Brown season last year. It was on T V and they were going for I think it was fourth down and him drop or it might have been third down, him dropping a ball wide open. Him dropping a ball. And that pretty much sums up I think what his career is gonna be, unfortunately. Maybe he could pick up something somewhere else, but Landry and Gordon are gonna get possibly upwards of 250 targets themselves. And that's two wide receivers on the team. The, the rookie out of Florida, the only reason that he didn't get drafted earlier was because he had some off the field stuff like most Florida players do these days. And he's going to have trouble even making the roster. I think, I mean, he's going to be pushing the fourth or maybe even fifth wide receiver. And like you were talking about options earlier, they brought in, they drafted Chubb and they have Hyde there also that they brought in. He's he's looking at a real battle to get on the, to make the team. Agreed. And I think if, if, if you own him in dynasty, you're sort of hoping he goes somewhere else. You're hoping that they pull off some kind of trade for a late round draft pick for next season or something and move him somewhere else. Cause you know, I think that if he stays where he's at, he has little to no value for sure. I believe. All right, uh, next one I got on the list here is for the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, Dee Westbrook, breakout or fake out? You know, I love the talent of this guy. I'm going to have to go fake out this year just because in kind of a situation in, like uh, Godwin in Tampa, like you look at that depth chart. I mean, they brought in Lee. They brought back Lee. And they have Moncrief on big guarantee money. These aren't guys. I mean, these aren't number one wide receivers. And they bought them in on big guarantee money. They're not going to cut either of those guys in the off season. And then they have Keelan Cole, who really outproduced what everybody thought he was going to do last year. I mean, and then they brought an off, awesome, you know, my boy, Austin Fire Jenkins <laughs> from the Jets, who's going to demand red zone targets. And he also drafted the uber talented DJ shark. I mean, it's, it's hard to think, but he could be in a battle for the fourth wide receiver on this team. And he is super talented. I just had to go fake out this year. I, I would keep him in dynasty as well. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, he's got, he's got tons of talent. I think that he can be something good, uh, given the opportunity, but it's opportunity that he's not going to get in Jacksonville with that depth chart. I mean, there's no like, amazing receiver there but there's a lot of decent talent that could be above him uh more experienced talent and i think that he can get buried in that depth chart pretty quickly here so unless there's some injuries there in jacksonville i don't see him being a breakout this year so i'm going to fake out as well uh all right got uh, a couple more here um let's go up to detroit for this one uh second year player uh came out like gangbusters last year i think in his first game his first official game i think he caught two touchdowns if i'm not mistaken uh, but Kenny Galladay uh, for the Detroit Lions, you can go break out or fake out with him. Oh, man. If you were in my admin chat, Kenny G, my team was named the Galladay in last year. <laughs> nice. We, 
We had we had guys up in Detroit. One of our admins goes to Lions camps every year, and he told me even before even before the season started, fantasy season said, "Grab that guy in any dynasty. He is super talented, and he has a lot of stuff favoring him as well, contract wise. I mean, he besides being talented, he's the biggest receiver that they have they have in red zone threat. So he's not going to Tate isn't really going to take anything away from him." He was close to beating out Marvin Jones last year in camp. Either way, and he's always overproduced. Marvin Jones this year has two years left on his contract. Can be cut for th- he has an eight million dollar cap hit after this year. Yeah, yeah he, I know he won't be here much longer. That's and for sure. <laughs> it's so he, they would have to eat three million of that contract. But I mean, I th- I see them moving away from him. And Tate's a free agent after this year. Dynasty wise, I would say he is on the prospect chart. He has to be top five dynasty wise prospects out there. I love him this year as a red zone threat standard. He has to be moved way up there in the in the top fifty at least on uh, on the chart. And he should he's being drafted usually around around fourteen or so. Yep. So he's kind of a bargain and worth taking a flyer on. Agreed. I think a lot of the 12 team redraft leagues, at least the mocks that I've been in, he's going almost undrafted in some leagues. So the value is definitely, definitely there. Um, I think you're right. I think he is that red zone threat. Uh, Stafford, you know, since he's lost Calvin, Calvin Johnson hasn't had that sort of big receiver since then. The tight ends that he's had there, of course, he's had Ebron for a few years and he should have been good in the red zone, but never really was. Uh, so Galladay could step into that role and be that red zone threat that they need. All right, I got two more here. Uh, we're going to go uh, with Trent Taylor, uh, the 49ers. Uh, he was an awesome third down receiver last year as a fan. I'm a 49ers fan. Uh, I believe he was top five in third down catches for first downs last year, which is a pretty amazing stat for a rookie. Uh, what do you think of Trent Taylor this year? Out of all the players that we've mentioned, I think he's probably the closest to push and pushes a total cop out. That I would go. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to be a fake out. This is the type of guy that you're going to get kind of like an Edelman or maybe what an Albert Wilson is going to do this year. This is a guy you're not going to be able to plug him in as your wide receiver two or even your wide receiver three. In my opinion, he's going to be a flex spot a week in week out fill in, but this is a guy that's going to get you some weeks, seven catches for 75 yards, eight catches for 65 yards in PPRs. He's going to be a good solid start some weeks, depending on what's going on there. I mean, Garcon is coming off a major neck injury. Goodwin, he's the deep threat. It all depends on what happens. Pettis could easily come in and just demand targets. I'm, I really haven't followed Pettis' progress through camp, but I know they have a little bit of crowding situation, but I think Taylor kind of has a niche there. Yeah, I agree. Well, I, I actually talked about uh, this on one of my last podcasts with Trent Taylor already there, and we drafted Pettis. I was kind of like, why do we just draft Pettis? We already have that player, basically Trent Taylor, on our team. But after speaking to one of my uh, one of my experts as an expert on college, uh, he thinks that Pettis can actually move into that number two role eventually when Garcon vacates it, uh, and then we'll keep Trent Taylor on the inside. So uh, it's an interesting dynamic for sure. And I think that Trent Taylor last year had a good uh, chemistry with Garoppolo, and I think if that continues, uh, he could be a definite PPR guy. Uh, like you said, he'll have weeks where he has seven catches, 80 yards. He's not going to give you the big play. Uh, he's just going to be a solid underneath kind of guy, Dam- Dammy, Danny Amendola type. Uh, that's just going to be a, a PPR monster. So I think uh, I think I definitely uh, – I'm going to go breakout with him. Uh, I think he's going to be flying under the radar. Breakout from where he's being drafted. Uh, I'm not saying he's going to go out and be a receiver one or a receiver two, but I think a breakout for him would be a flex or even a – a low end receiver three in the deep league. So yeah, I agree with you on that one as well. Uh, all right. To finish this out here, we're going to go uh, to LA with this one. Uh, he had a pretty good rookie season last year and a pretty good offense. Actually, I think the number two offense in the league last year in LA uh, Cooper cup breakout or fake out. Well, I'm going to go breakout, but I don't think he's necessarily going to, you know, Randy Moss it up or anything like that. I mean, he had 75 catches over 800 yards last year as a rookie, even with cooks coming in, he still has a niche, you know, looking like an Ed McCaffrey type deal, like a possession guy. Have you seen this guy's highlight tape? I mean, he's amazing. 
And I have him as with along with Galladay as two of my top five prospects in dyn- in dynasty leagues right now of, of receivers that you have loved to grab. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I love Cup as well. I actually uh, just missed out on Cup last season in my dynasty draft. Uh, I was one pick away from getting him. Uh, I think I ended up with Chris Godwin instead. Uh, and I wish I had gotten Cup because I, you know, I loved him. I wanted to get him. Unfortunately, I just missed out on him and regretted it ever since. But I think uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go slight breakout on him as well. Uh, again, I don't think he's gonna be like the, you know, the second coming of of uh, Tory Holt or anything crazy there in a in a Rams uniform. But I think I think he's gonna be a solid receiver and someone you're gonna want to own, especially with Jared Goff sort of coming into his own. All right, with that, we're going to go ahead and do a quick commercial break. Uh, when we come back after the break, we'll play a little bit of over-under, and, of course, we'll play some keep-cut trade. You want to just hang in there for a little bit? We'll be right back. Three shows, one podcast. The Talk Loud Radio podcast combines sports, nerds, and pop culture with the Pay Me No Mind show, just down to earth sports and entertainment. The Clash of the Nerds Let's Podcast Show. The latest movies and video games with a dash of comedy. And the Armchair Fantasy Show. Eight sleep fantasy sports. Find Talk Loud Radio on all the major podcast services like iTunes and Stitcher at TalkLoudRadio.com and streaming on the Going For Two app for iOS and Android. Talk Loud Radio, where sports, nerds, Nerds and pop culture collide. Do you need advice for your fantasy football team? How about your DraftKings or FanDuel lineup? Goingfor2.com has you covered. Goingfor2.com has exclusive content from some of the best fantasy writers in the industry, whose credentials include Bleacher Report, Fantasy Pros, and Fantasy Life. From advice columns to player ranks, Goingfor2.com has it all. Sign up for our newsletter to have all of our content sent to your inbox. Start winning today. Visit goingfor2.com because no one remembers the extra point. All right, welcome back. Uh, we are here with Ed Figurehunt of the Fancy Football Fraternity on Facebook. Definitely check him out. Uh, I think it's a great page to follow. Uh, lots of breaking news type stuff, instant reactions to injuries and such. Uh, I just started following them maybe about a month ago. And we connected, and uh, it's been a it's been a good thing ever since. So uh, good stuff, man. Uh, Ed, so far I uh, get some great content here, and we're going to go ahead and play a little over and under. You want to start that? Oh, awesome! Let's go. All right, so basically how this works, I'm going to give you a scenario on a certain player, uh, an over-under scenario, and you tell me if it's going to be over or under and uh, why you think that. So the first one we're going to kick off with here is going to be second-year receiver Corey Davis. Had a disappointing rookie season, of course, dealt with a lot of injuries. Uh, but over-under, a top 25 wide receiver, so he'd be in the wide receiver two range. Uh, you can go over or under top 25 for Corey Davis. I have him under, but not by much. I have him in between like the 28th to 33rd around that area. I think he can step forward, and I think his ne- his real breakout is next year. Yeah, I got him slightly under as well. I think I actually own him in my dynasty league, but I got him a little bit under. Uh, I do think he's going to be that number one receiver that we hoped that he was going to be last year. Uh, but I think in that Titans offense, they want to run the ball, and I don't think that. Mariota is going to be a high volume quarterback, so Davis will be a little bit under. But um, I still love him if, in, in where he's being drafted. I do like where he's going, so uh, definitely under there. All right, number two, we'll stick with the number the second year receivers. Uh, another disappointing guy from last season, uh, Mike Williams, over under top thirty. So he's a borderline wide receiver three, un- over under top thirty for Mike Williams. I got him way under, man. I mean, I understand why the Chargers drafted him. With Keenan Allen coming off back to back just devastating years. But if Keenan Allen's back, he is not getting the work. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. Even with Hunter Henry going down, their running backs, if you look at it, their running backs got well over 100 targets alone last year. 
and that says Eckler and Gordon. And that's just going to, that's just going to continue to improve. Rivers is really starting to check down a lot more of the, in his older years with that weird, uh, <laughs> that weird, that weird throw yeah. he has there. Yeah, definitely. I think so I'm I got him way under. Yeah, I got him way under as well. I, I, the reason I put him here at, you know, this over under, I said it there is because I've seen him going really high in drafts. Uh, granted, it's mock drafts. It's super early in the season. Uh, you can't really gauge how it's going to be come August. Uh, but I've seen him going up into that, that sort of wide receiver three range, and I want to get your idea, your thoughts on that. And I, I agree with you. I think he's way under. I think in that offense, he's not going to get enough volume to uh, to be a top th- uh, 30 receiver for sure. So, yeah, I'm going under as well. All right, going once again to the second year wide receivers here. This guy was the one receiver last year, I think, as a rookie that had a good season uh, in fantasy. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster over under top 15, which puts him as a borderline wide receiver one. Uh, where are you going with Juju? You know, I honestly, I have him about right there. You know, either the, or the I, I, I think I have him as the top of the wide receiver twos. I'm not personally comfortable with him as my wide receiver one, but we've seen Martavis Bryant had big years in that offense. Ben slings that ball around all the time. I mean, if you, if there's worse players to be stuck with as your wide receiver one than Juju. So, I mean, I'll buy into him as a top 15 wide receiver. The page, a lot of our admins loved him this year and me included. I'll take him. Yeah. I think I'm going to go uh, slightly under with Juju. Um, I, I guess I'm not quite as high as everybody else is on Juju. I, I mean, I do like him. I think he's going to have a great season. I think now that uh, Bryant is now in uh, in Oakland, I think that opens up some doors for him. Um, but I just don't. I, I just don't know. I just with Antonio Brown still there, and with Le'Veon Bell still there, and you know uh, Vance McDonald sort of came into his own at the end of the last season. I think Juju sort of gets a little bit overlooked in that offense. I mean, we know Pittsburgh offense is really good. They can sustain quite a bit of fantasy relevancy. Uh, I think at one point, I think uh, Antonio Brown was the number one overall receiver and Bell's the number one overall running back, which almost never happens on one team. Um, But I think wide receiver one might be a little bit pushing it. I would be more comfortable with him as a low end two and a high end three. Uh, so I'm going to put him under on that, uh, just a little bit under, but he can definitely go off for sure. He's got the big playability we saw last year. So, um, you never know, but I'm gonna go slightly under on Juju. All right. The next one I got here is a guy that I've seen all over the board. Uh, either you love this guy or you hate this guy. Uh, and that's Josh Doxson, uh, over under top 35 receiver. So we're looking at a borderline receiver three or a solid flex. Where do you have Doxon over under top 35? I got him way under there. And I, I agree with you. I've seen him all over the map. I've seen people taking this, this guy as their, as their flex. I, I am not buying it. I think people <laughs> forget Paul Richardson came in. Paul Richardson is another injured wide receiver at all times, but he is a deep field threat. And if, and, and another injury, talk about injury prone, Jordan Reed, if he can stay healthy, Jordan Reed is going to demand almost, probably 150 targets from Alex Smith. We saw what happened in, in Kansas City with Kelsey there. And with Chris Thompson also, I just don't they, – they play kind of a conservative offense. Smith down the field throws last year I think it was a bit of an anomaly. And I see them being more conservative, and I really don't see much room for a in my top – barely a top 50, maybe, you know, top 60 receiver. Yeah, I'm a little bit higher on Doxon than you are. I think I think we had this talk a little bit on Facebook. Um, I think I'm going to have him right around that range as a as a borderline flex play. Uh, the thing that sort of has me worried is because Doxon's biggest uh, his biggest asset really is 50 50 balls. Uh, he's a he's a freak athlete. He can jump out of the roof. Uh, you know, he can get up there and get those 50 50 balls. But Alex Smith is not a great 50 50 ball thrower. Uh, he never has been. He's the kind of quarterback if you're open. He'll hit you when you're open, but he's not throwing the ball into tight coverage. He's not going to toss it up there for 50-50 balls. He's just not that kind of quarterback. Never has been. And I, I think that kind of hurts him a little bit because, you know, you need that sort of – I mean, you look at like uh, McCown for the for the Jets last year. I think he's a he's a perfect 50-50 ball thrower. When he had uh, Brandon Marshall, Austin Jeffrey at the Bears, I mean, they both had phenomenal years because he's a great 
50 50 ball thrower he you know he puts out there with only only his guy can get it and Doxon's that kind of receiver but I don't think Smith's the right quarterback for him uh, I think most of his points will be coming on touchdowns not necessarily a PPR type thing I think his touchdowns will be what makes or breaks his fancy season and if Alex Smith isn't throwing those 50 50 balls to him he's not going to have enough touchdowns to rack up so I'm going to go I'm going to go slightly under uh, top 35 but uh, not quite as low as you are him and uh, Devontae Parker can sit down in a room together, I think. They're, <laughs> yeah. not getting the, they're not going to get thrown the ball in the red zone. Yep, agreed, agreed. Both Tannehill and Alex Smith are sort of in that same mold where if you're open, you're getting the ball, but I'm not throwing it to you for a 50-50 ball. I'm just not going to risk it. So, yeah, I agree. They're both in the same situation. Uh, all right, last one I got here. We talked about a little bit earlier today or a little bit earlier in the show. Uh, Sterling Shepard over under top 35. So in the same range as Doxson. Uh, borderline wide receiver three or solid flex. Where do you got Sterling Shepard? I got Sterling Shepard around, you know, around that 28 to 35 range. I think where he's being drafted, I think it's almost criminal. He's the Giants are going to throw the ball, even with Barkley there. It's not, it's not going to matter with Barkley there. Eli's still going to throw that ball, even though he's a little older now. And he's not going to be looking as deep as much anyway, which is going to be Odell Beckham. Although Beckham demands double teams on probably half the plays. And with Barkley there, with Barkley there to keep the play action honest, I think Shepard has a real chance to break out this year. Yep, I'm with you there as well. I think uh I think currently I might have him a little bit uh under in my rankings. Uh, I haven't updated them in a little bit because uh redraft is kind of hard to to rank this early. In Dynasty, it's a different story, but uh, I got him slightly under currently, but I think I'm going to move him to over that top 35 just because I think in that offense, uh, I think that he can definitely be a PPR guy. Uh, he won't get a lot of touchdowns probably, but uh, PPR leagues, he'd definitely be a, a very good viable option. All right, now we're going to play a little uh, keep cut trade. You ever done this before? Keep cut trade? You ever play that game? Oh, yes. I love the keep cut trade. We play that all the time. Yep. Good stuff. All right. So basically, for the listeners that haven't heard of keep cut trade, uh, I'm going to give uh, three three names. Uh, he has to keep one. He has to cut one and he has to trade one and explain his reasoning why. Uh, sticking with the receiver theme, we're going to go with uh, Corey Davis, Juju Smith-Schuster and Mike Williams. Who are you going to keep? Who are you going to cut? And who are you going to trade? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to trade Corey Davis. He's a real hot name right now, especially in dynasty. And I think he's, I think you can get some real value future value out of him. If you're in a redraft, I think you can get maybe a flex or a wide or a running back three. I'm going to keep Juju for sure. I, I got the faith in him. He's a, he's a great player. And like I said earlier, Mike Williams, just he might have all the talent, but he's just not going to get a chance there in uh, San Diego, in my opinion. Agreed. I think I'm going to go a little bit different um, just because I like to take chances and uh, I'm actually going to try to trade Juju. I think Juju is uh, his his peak right now of of of, uh, of value is right now. Uh, I don't think he's going to have quite as much usage as everyone wants him to have in the season. I just think he'll be overshadowed by Brown and by Bell and Vance McDonald and everything else. So I think that his value right now is, is skyrocketed. So I'm gonna try to get me a, a running back two out of Juju. Maybe you know talk to a Steelers fan, see if I can get you know something really good for him. I'm gonna keep Corey Davis because I think he's gonna be the the, the receiver one there in, in Tennessee. Uh, I think he's gonna get a ton of targets in PPR. I think he'll be a good viable option for me. Uh, may not have the same flashy big uh, big play appeal as Juju does, but. I think he'll be a solid receiver for me. And like you, I'm cutting Mike Williams. I know he was, you know, highly sought after rookie, you know, but he's in, he's in, uh, he's in San Diego. Sorry, I almost said San Diego. He's in LA now. And I think he's overshadowed a little bit by Keenan Allen. So I think I'm going to cut Mike Williams on that one. Uh, all right. Next one I got here. I've got uh, Josh Doxson, Sterling Shepard, and Cooper Cup. Who are you going to keep? Who are you going to cut? And who are you going to trade? Ooh, two of my favorites, and I'm going to cut Dawson <laughs> right away. Saw that one coming. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but um, Shepard and Cup, that is a tough one. I think I'd have to keep Shepard just because of the fact that I think you can get a little bit more for Cup just by his name alone. 
I, I would probably shop both, and I, I would be comfortable keeping either. But I think you get more trade value at a cup, especially in Dynasty League. You could probably get a possibly a future first rounder for cup, maybe even more. And Shepard, I just I think people are, have the stigma with Odell Beckham that Shepard's just not that good, which is just not the case. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to bring up a little bit of a of strategy here, and this is sort of like uh, knowing your league. Uh, and knowing the area that you live in and how things are. Uh, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, so i got a ton of Redskins fans in all of my leagues that you know play close here. And I'm going to try to trade Josh Doxson because I, I listen to sports radio here, and they're high on Josh Doxson. They think he's going to be you know, the best thing since sliced bread. So I'm going to try to trade Josh Doxson just based on the fact that I know that all my leagues are Redskins fans. I can probably get somebody good for him. Uh, so I'm going to try to trade Josh Doxson. Uh, as much as it pains me to say it, I think I'm cutting Sterling Shepard, uh, and I want to keep Cooper Cup. I think he has the higher upside going forward. I think he's going to be in the better offense. Uh, Eli Manning's not going to play for another 10 years, so I think uh, I got Jared Goff there with Cooper Cup. I think I had that connection for a couple years in my Dynasty League, so I'll cut Shepard even though I love him this year. That one's tough. That one is a tough one. It is. All right, the next one I got is tough on the opposite spectrum because I think all of these guys are predicted to be sort of bad this year, uh, but you got to keep one. Uh, so I'm going to go with Tyler Boyd, John Ross, and Zay Jones. You got to keep one, cut one, and trade one. Oof. My first thought is to cut them all. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think I would have to keep Tyler Boyd and just hope, I mean, maybe there. Not that I would hope anybody ever gets injured, but maybe there's an AJ Green injury, a Mixon injury, something where he might get more targets. John Ross, you know what? I'll try to trade him a dynasty. Somebody will want to take a chance on him. Somebody, I'll get something, something I can make out of him. I'm not sure what, but I'll get some <laughs> kind of future value out of him. And Zay Jones, <clears throat> I'm going to cut. I don't. I don't see any kind of feature there. He already, he's already showing his off field issues. He didn't play against elite competition in college. He's up and stuck in Buffalo where who knows what's going to go on with their passing situation. Yeah, I think I'm going the exact same way as you are. I think if we look historically at wide receivers, uh, you know, before we had the old Dell Beckhams and the Calvin Johnsons that break out in year one, they're just absolute athletic freaks. Uh, but traditionally, year three is the year that receivers sort of break out. It's sort of their year that they sort of figure out the offense. They figure out how to run routes, and it sort of becomes a slower game for them in their mind. So I'm going to go and go ahead and keep Tyler Boyd and hope that he hits that three-year mark and does have sort of a breakout season. Maybe not like a A.J. Green type season, but, you know, if he can just give me some solid value, uh, I'm going to keep him. I will try to train John Roth. I think he, coming into just his second year, uh, he had injuries last year, so you can sort of play that card with your trade value to say, oh, yeah, he in injured all last year, so maybe he can break out this season. Uh, so I'm going to try to trade him, and, yeah, I'm cutting Zay Jones. I just think even if he has the talent and even if he wasn't you know, off the field issues, uh, the quarterback and the offense he plays in is not going to get any better anytime soon, so I'm going to cut Zay Jones as well. All right, we got one more here, and then we can uh, we can wrap everything up. Uh, we're going to go with uh, Trent Taylor, uh, of course, with the 49ers, D.D. Westbrook, uh, and your boy that you talked up pretty good here, Kenny Galladay. Which one are you going to keep? Which one are you going to cut? And who are you going to trade? Well, of course, I'll make it easy for the first one. I'm going to keep Kenny. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I just think the talent's just way up there. Uh, this next one's kind of hard. I don't – and I know I like, I like Trent Taylor, too, but I think you'll get – in a dynasty, I think you'll get decent trade value. I actually traded D.D. Westbrook for uh, my cuff, Austin Eckler, earlier in the offseason in one of my dynasties. I think you can get you can get a solid player by trading D.D. Westbrook. You're not going to get a solid player for from Trent Taylor. He's a good player, and I'll I'll start him in some of my flexes this year in some of my leagues. But I'd have to cut Trent Taylor because I just don't see me getting any value back for him. Yep, I'm going to go the same way there. I think I'm keeping Kelly Galladay. I think the the ceiling, the sky is the ceiling for this guy. I think he could be, you know, like you said, next year he'll be the number one receiver there, likely with Marvin Jones' big contract and 
you know, Golden Tate being a free agent, they can move on from both those guys and make Gallaudet their number one. So I think the potential there is 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 definite. Uh, D.D. Westbrook, I think I think you're right. I think he does have a little bit more value than Trent Taylor. And D.D. Westbrook, you know, you can sort of sell that big playability, which you don't have with Trent Taylor. He's more of a a solid underneath sort of PPR guy, but he's not going to give you the big plays where I think Westbrook has that athletic ability to do that. So you can sort of sell that in your trade. And I think I'll get more value for Westbrook. So I'll trade Westbrook. And as much as it hurts me to say, as a 49ers fan, I'm going to cut Trent Taylor. All right, man. Hey, I appreciate you. That wraps the podcast up for today. Uh, again, guys, make sure you check out Fantasy Football Fraternity on Facebook. Uh, we we're talking tonight to Ed Fingerhut of that. He is the owner and operator of that Facebook page. Uh, I think they have like 31,000 followers, I believe, if I'm correct on that. Uh, a good amount of followers and a lot of good stuff there. I think if you follow them, you won't be disappointed. Uh, I want to thank you again for coming on tonight, Ed. I appreciate it. I definitely want to get you back on at some point before the start of the season. Absolutely. I want to thank all my admins, my right-hand man, Jeremiah Orcutt, all my admins. You right. guys are doing a great job, and I appreciate your support, sir. All right. Good deal. That's a wrap. Have a good night. I'm out here. <laughs>